Hi, this is Scott Cherry. Today I'm going to interview Wissam Youssef about a profound and excellently well-written book that he has written, Islam in Christ's Eyes. As you know, Islam is very prominent in the world, becoming more and more prominent in the United States. You know, many Muslims are moving into your communities. You may or may not have relationships with them. I recommend you do try to have relationships with them because so many Muslims are sweet, dear people. But worldwide, there are many different perspectives on the subject. And this is Wissam Yusuf, who has written Islam in Christ's Eyes. He actually acknowledges that. He says, yes, there are so many perspectives on Islam. How do you know which one to believe? Let's start with that question, because that's one of the fundamental questions of your book, Wissam. Thank you, Scott. Well, exactly as you said. I mean, if you ask about Islam, there are as many answers as there are people. If you ask a preacher in the Dearborn area, he would give you one answer. If you ask a preacher in, say, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, you will hear a different answer. If you ask an imam in Chicago, that's a third answer. An imam in Cairo, Egypt, that would give you a fourth answer. As a Christian, I believe in absolute facts. Uh, what does Islam say about itself? And is there a way for us to know that truth? Uh, I believe that the truth about Islam is found first in the document of Islam that is called the Quran. When you open, when you actually open the Quran and see what's in there, uh, that is the most credible source that tells you what Islam is all about. And second of all, you need to interpret or handle uh, the Quran, the way it was supposed to be interpreted. Now, I came from a Muslim background, and uh, thanks to uh, none other than Saddam Hussein, we had to study the Quran, the whole Quran, in the Iraqi schools before graduation from high school. And because of my Muslim background, I used to go to mosque every Friday. And uh, Islam was a subject that was taught uh, uh, every day on TV and, uh, and the other media in Iraq. But it was when I went to a Bible school here in the United States that I developed that uh, critical reading of the scriptures that uh, I think uh, uh, gave me a different perspective that I'm sharing in this book. Yes. Now, you mentioned uh, something already about your, your Muslim background. Uh, that, to me, seems that it makes you uniquely qualified to, to write Islam in, in Christ's eyes. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that story? You know, you have to give us the short version, I think. Otherwise, uh, we'll deviate from the subject of the book. But, but yeah, you, you were a Muslim, and now you're a Christian. How did that happen? Absolutely, and that is not a deviation from the book. Actually, the second half of the book is my full uh, conversion story. Now, I was born and raised to a Muslim family in Baghdad in 1979 in January. And uh, saying in January uh, puts that in the context of uh, the Islamic revolution that happened in the neighboring Iran a month later. And uh, Saddam Hussein assuming office in Iraq uh, six months later. And so I was born and raised in, a, in that uh, uh, volatile uh, community. And the war broke out between the two countries to last for eight years. And that was my childhood. Uh, I was born and raised in a world that was not told to love one another. Uh, that's the beginning of the story. It was in the middle of my teenage years, uh, in the middle of the 1990s, that I witnessed the collapse of uh, the social life of Iraq because of the pan-Arab nationalism and the, quote, faith campaign that Saddam Hussein launched in the aftermath of uh, the first Gulf War. And uh, that caused in me a dissatisfaction with the way of life and the way things were going to in Iraq. Now remember, Iraq was uh, fairly stable at that time, but there was a steady decline in uh, the social uh, aspect of Iraq. And there was always the uh, anticipation of war and uh, the feeling that there was an unfinished job in the first Gulf War that eventually led to the fall of the whole system of Iraq, uh, headed by Saddam Hussein at that time. Well, it was in the middle of the 1990s, in the middle of my teenage years, when my four-year-old sister passed. And that 
caused a shock in, in, in me at that uh, uh, critical part of my life and uh, caused me to eventually reject Islam into atheism. Hmm. Uh, I felt that void inside of me and I tried to satisfy that void with entertainment and with watching movies and reading books and listening to music and uh, most of the books that I read and the movies that I watched quoted the Bible. And so that uh, generated in me an interest to get a copy of the Bible only to understand those quotes from those books and those movies. I went to a flea market in Baghdad, bought my first Bible. And I started questioning what was in that book, which I fell in love with for being good way before I believed in it for being true. Um, long story short, I eventually became a believer in 1999. That was in my third year in college studying civil engineering in the University of Baghdad. I had quite a few believing friends and they were circulating all those Christian materials and those magazines with the coupons that you clip and mail to the Bible study societies and you get all those uh, Christian uh, tracts and cassettes and, and all. One of them brought an old copy of a book uh, that had a disclaimer at the beginning of it. Do not share that book with Muslims. The book's title was A Priest and a Prophet. And so I said, can I take a look at that book? They said, no, there is a very strong disclaimer here. I said, you know I'm not, no longer a Muslim. They said, well, so you say. Hmm. And so I was curious to find out what that book was so much, and I did not see it. Fast forward 12 years later, I am in the United States in a Bible school in April of 2012 with the church history class teacher assigning me to do a 15 minute long presentation on Islam. That's when I remembered that we now have the internet and I have a credit card and I am in the United States. Nobody can tell me not to read any book. So I went online and lo and behold, the book was there for free on PDF. Well, when I read it, I did not totally agree with the book that talks about the origins of Islam. Uh, a priest and a prophet, the prophet, of course, being the prophet Muhammad, the founder of Islam and the priest uh, was a man that is known in the Islamic history as Waraka bin Nofal. Uh, the missing link between the Judaizers and Islam, if you will, that term, missing link. Uh, but I was impressed with the presentation in that book that uh, opened my eyes to the fact that had always been in front of me, but I failed to notice it. And that is, if you actually read the Quran, you cannot miss the theological parallels and the historical connections between Islam and between the, the Bible-based faith, whatever that is. Islam was not born separately from something that resembles the Bible. And uh, I made my 15-minute presentation and uh, I was invited days later to share it with, uh, ironically, a ladies' Bible class in a Baptist church in Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. A few days later, I was invited to share an hour-long version of that, so I studied more. M a month later, I was invited to share that in a, a church in Houston, Texas, a two-hour-long version. And, and every time I'm invited to share a longer version, I had to study more. And once again, I had studied the Quran in Iraq as Muslim and from Muslim teachers. But the Bible school trained me to read scriptures with a more critical eye. So I actually read the entire Quran in a chronological order and wrote my own notes. And this book is the result of, of that effort. Excellent, thank you very much. And you're making your own transitions, which makes it much easier for me to interview you. Okay, thank you. I think it, I could just let you keep talking. And uh, I'm, uh, that, that, that makes my job really easy. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, go ahead. But, but you did make reference to some of the things that I was about to ask you next. Again, we're talking about Islam in Christ's eyes, if you just uh, tuned in. And uh, the second half of the book has Wissam's full testimony of conversion. So if now you just have a, a taste of it, you can get all the details of his story, how God captured his heart and brought him into the family of Christ. Literally, without any Christian witness, 
which is one of the things that um, impresses me. Um, in fact, I want to you know probe into that a little bit more. But um, on just one brief point, tell us what was that really well-known American movie that had scripture references. Look, it's, it's interesting. This is so many people's most favorite part of my conversion story. And so in the heat of my atheism, and uh, I was in my late teenage years, and I thought that if I lived in a world that did not have God, I would be happy. And I know now that I did not feel that happiness back then. And I sought entertainment at the time. And uh, uh, I was watching a movie, and it was in my second year in college that the first Mission Impossible movie was released. Uh, there was this scene when Tom Cruise picked the Gideon's Bible and read Job 3.14. That was the first time in my life I see a page of the Bible. Of course, I had always heard of the Bible. The Bible is mentioned in the Quran. In fact, the belief in the Bible is one of the six pillars of faith in Islam. But for a Muslim, the Bible is, well, imagine um, gifting a, uh, a book on computer engineering from the 1950s to, to a computer programmer today. Totally irrelevant, uh, unnecessary uh, waste of time. And that's how a Muslim imagines the Bible. And uh, because that movie was cool and I wanted to understand the context of what Tom Cruise was reading, that's when I got my first Bible. Okay, so was Mission Impossible starring Tom Cruise? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now that that to me is um, just striking. And um, knowing you, I think you're um, a, an expert in, in in pop culture, and you have a great sense of humor and a lot of your uh, knowledge of uh, pop culture, both you know Iraqi pop culture and and now American pop culture, which seem to to bleed together in your in your life experience. Uh, if, you, if you know Wissam, uh, a lot of that is going to come out very, very quickly and you're going to have lots of laughs uh, with Wissam's jokes about pop culture. And so uh, I, many people appreciate that about you. But you, you talked about, you made reference to the progression and the uh, sort of the evolution of Islam. And you also made reference to the Judaizers. And so in your book, I noted that you talk about the progression of Islam, that it wasn't always what it is now, and it, and it wasn't even always a separate religion. It started as something much more like Judaism. So can you talk about that progression of, of the history of Islam? Absolutely. Uh, it is a well-known fact, at least among Muslims, that the Quran the standard Quran that we have today is not arranged in a chronological order. Uh, chapter 1 in the Quran was the seventh chapter that was delivered by Muhammad. Chapter 96 of the Quran was the first chapter that was delivered by Muhammad. And there is a well-known, if you go online and Google Quran in a chronological order, you would find that uh, order and it is uh, uh, listed in my book. Yeah, can I interrupt you uh, sure. uh, to talk to the audience a little bit here? Um, in chapter 1, uh, the index that Wissam is making reference to starts on page 33 and it continues for uh, six pages in which he reorders the 114 surahs of the Quran. Uh, so what Wissam is talking about is, yeah, these 114 surahs are not in chronological order. They're in actually... Uh, an order that's hard to understand the rationale of it. Maybe Wissam understands it. But, but in his book, he, he rearranges them uh, so that you can understand exactly which surahs occurred first and then which ones occurred next and which ones you know, were the final surahs. For example, Surah 9 is the last surah in the chronology of all 114, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. So that index is, is really helpful in your book. Well, uh, to, uh, to, ta t uh, I mean, to talk about uh, the, the purpose behind the writing of that book, uh, it is 
uh, mostly to the Christian audience. It assumes that the reader not only is familiar with the Bible, but believes in the Bible as the inspired Word of God. And the purpose uh, uh, behind the writing of this book is to equip that Christian to uh, share the love of Christ first and then the truth of his gospel with that Christian's Muslim neighbor. The good news is you can share the gospel with anyone and you do not need any knowledge about Islam. The bad news is if you do not do that carefully and uh, uh, accurately, and if you make any assumption about the Islamic faith, it would be difficult to recover from that awkwardness if you go to your Muslim neighbor and say, well, I know that you are worshiping the moon, so I have good news for you. I am introducing to you the God who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Your Muslim neighbor would say, you have no idea what I'm worshiping, and I'm not interested in listening to the rest of what you have. So to get to the evangelism part, I think it would be helpful to take a look at the theology part and what Muslims actually believe, at least the common thing that all Muslims have always believed in. And that leads us to why did I read the Quran in a chronological order? Here is why. Is Islam peaceful or is it violent? Hmm. Many Muslims would say that Islam is peace. A question that all Americans yep. ask who know anything about Islam. Absolutely. And uh, to get to the American part, uh, an average American before 1990 showed little or no interest in Islam. Then in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, there was some interest in Islam, probably for the wrong reasons. Uh, Islam became a key word in the American politics in the aftermath of 9-11. But global terrorism should not be the main reason why an American should be interested in Islam. In fact, uh, if you ever met a real-life Muslim living in the United States, if you ever had Muslim neighbors uh, in your neighborhood, you would know that most of them are hard-working good citizens and uh, they are peaceful and they have nothing to do with what the Quran ultimately preaches. So many Muslims, especially in the Western world, say that Islam is peace, and they may not be lying. They may be sincerely believing that based on certain passages of the Quran. And yet we know that the Quran has violent parts. I was at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York City in 2016, and I saw the letter that the uh, spiritual leader of the 19 hijackers uh, wrote to them, and he told them to read chapters 8 and 9 in the night of the, the attack. And so these are very violent passages. Is Islam tolerant to the rest of the Abrahamic faiths? Does it acknowledge Christianity as a way to heaven and Judaism? Most Muslims would say yes, and they are not lying. Uh, other Muslims would say no, Islam is the only and the final uh, pure way to God, and every other way is not accepted. They are not lying either. They are quoting other parts of the Quran. Hmm. How can I find my way in the midst of this discrepancy in the Quran? Here is how. It is useful to study the life of Muhammad as a claimed prophet from the age when he said that he was re receiving revelations from God at the age of 40 uh, in the year 610 AD uh, until he died at the age of 52. The Islam that Muhammad started was not the same Islam that Muhammad ended up, uh, uh, ended up with. Uh, the first decade of Muhammad's life as a prophet did not really inter introduce any new religion. If you read all the 55 chapters at the first decade of the Islamic history, Muhammad talked about general things about God, about Satan, about heaven and hell, about righteousness and uh, sin, and about benevolence and other things. He told people to pray, but did not tell them how. He told them to fast, but did not tell them how. It was when he delivered chapter 6 of the Quran that we have today that he introduced the first deviation from the Bible's pattern. And that's when he introduced a new kosher law that was different than the Jewish kosher law. It's interesting to uh, point out that the difference was camels, not kosher in Judaism, kosher or halal in Islam. A year later, he migrated from Mecca to Medina, and in order for him to mobilize the Muslim community to fight those who had persecuted them back in Mecca, he delivered, or he started delivering those violent passages in the Quran. 
The Quran actually tells you that if you find any discrepancy between two passages of the Quran, you check which one came uh, later. And that uh, is the truth about Islam and not the earlier one. That is an actual Islamic doctrine called abrogation. I think it is uh, mentioned in chapter 2, verse 106 in the Quran. And so that's the reason why I uh, presented the Quran in a chronological order. Sure. Yeah, in one passage you said, uh, many people say the Quran is not consistent. And the Quran itself says it is not Ab absolutely. consistent. Yes because of the doctrine of abrogation. What, what exactly is that? Uh, I think the verse says exactly, if we, uh, supposedly God is talking, and plural, uh, if we abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, we replace it with one uh, better than it or one equal to it. There are many things to read in this verse. First of all, not only does the Quran tell you that there are differences in the Quran and inconsistencies, uh, but it tells you actually that Muhammad did forget some of his revelations, which kind of challenges the Muslim belief that the Quran that we have today is the exact Quran that is written somewhere in heaven, the eternal Quran that has been there from the year minus infinity and will be there to the year plus infinity. Uh, the Quran says that what Muhammad delivered was not the exact same uh, Quran that was intended to be delivered. Hmm. The other thing is, your Muslim neighbor may apply that in a sense of the most famous Muslim argument in favor of abrogation is the banning of alcohol in Islam. They said Arabs are natural or were natural drinkers. I'm not talking about Arabs today. And uh, the Quran could not have banned alcohol immediately. So that came in uh, stages. And in the beginning, God said, well, the alcohol has benefits and, and, and the damages, but the damages are more than the benefits. And then he said, well, you can uh, get drunk, but do not pray while you're drunk. And then uh, at the third stage, he said, uh, anyone who, uh, like a, a, a alcohol is an abomination. And so that's when the banning happened. Well, okay, but what about the rest of the Quran passages that cannot be reconciled with this chronological evolution. Uh, for example, what the Quran teaches about uh, um, the other faiths. Uh, in one passage of the Quran, it is said that Jews and Christians go to heaven. In another passage, uh, you read that uh, uh, not only do they not or are they not promised heaven, but Muslims are required to fight them until they convert to Islam. And so how can you reconcile that? Uh, that is the reason why I brought up this, this abrogation doctrine. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. Now, in, in this rather sh short interview, uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end. Let me kind of zoom out and ask you, Wissam, what, what would you say is the most important takeaway that Christians, when they read your book, should capture? What is it that you really want them to learn in a, in a nutshell? Okay, uh, the curiosity is there, whether it's among Christians or among Americans, uh, regardless of their faith. And uh, every time I presented the materials of those books, by the way, uh, the, this book has been presented in around 200 congregations uh, around the United States in the past six or seven years. Uh, it has been taught in schools and in colleges in uh, small Bible study groups and by homeschooling parents. And so every time I present the materials there, they would ask me, do you have that written in a book? Hmm. And so I assume the curiosity is there and anyone can take whenever or whatever he or she wants. What I would like the, the person to take is to be equipped to share the love of Christ and the truth of his gospel with their Muslim neighbors, because there is no reason uh, why sh uh, we should not do that. And uh, that should be based on the motive that you love your Muslim neighbor so much that you want to spend the eternity with him or, or her. Uh, I cannot, unfortunately, change people's minds about the Muslim people. And uh, I understand uh, that they may not share my love for my Muslim relatives. I love Muslims. Uh, all my relatives are Muslims. 
most of my friends are Muslims. I love their culture. I love their music. I love their food. And I know that an American's exposure to Islam may be different, and I totally respect that. But if you ever get a copy of that book, I uh, pray that it touches your heart, that it gives you the boldness that you need to first love your Muslim neighbor, and then try to share the gospel with him. Amen. And, and I think you really go into depth in part three of your book, yeah. Christ for Muslims. Um, you believe that Muslims need to be saved. I believe that everyone needs to be saved. I, uh, you know, uh, many people would tell you that Islam and Christianity are two alternative ways and that it does not really matter as long as you worship the same God. And that cannot be true because both scriptures disagree with you. Christ claims to be the only way to God and Islam claims to be the only way to God. So they both agree that there is only one way to God and they disagree on which one is that way. And uh, I have my reasons to believe that what the Bible says is true. And I talked about that in a whole chapter about the Quran or the Bible. Why do I believe that the Bible is inspired as it claims? Uh, while the Quran says that it had been delivered by the same God that, that had inspired the Bible, but fails to prove it. Hmm. And because of that, I believe that anyone out of Christ is not saved. And that should concern me as a Christian. And that should be the motive why I should obey Christ's great commission. Amen. Now, what is, in a very brief uh, version here, what is the message of salvation that a Muslim needs to hear and to receive? Uh, the message of salvation is the good news that we call the gospel, which is Greek for good news. When you talk about good news in the United States, you assume there are bad news. The bad news is that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, um, uh, my father passed less than a year ago. And when I shared the gospel with him, and I was here in the United States, uh, I asked him, do you believe that you have ever committed any sin in your life? And he sincerely answered, no, I have not. And I was shocked, surprised, almost offended to hear that answer that I did not expect because I expected everyone to believe that he or she has not lived a life that is perfect in the eye of God. A few weeks later, I watched a documentary about the Iraq-Iran war in the 1980s. And uh, uh, when I saw the rhetoric from both countries and how each country claimed to be the all true country that is following God and fighting the, the, the all evil other country, uh, that kind of reminded me uh, of the rhetoric that non-Christians sincerely believe that they are right and they have not done anything wrong in their lives. And any person who is sincere, who takes a deep look on this world and deep on himself or herself knows that this is not true. The bad news is that we all have sinned and that sin is what caused our separation and spiritual death. The good news is Jesus Christ has paid the penalty of your sin and he died for your sin. Uh, Paul defines the gospel. When we look at the definition of uh, anything, we look for that line, the highlighted line in, in the textbook that says, well, the gospel is such and such. And Paul defines that in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says that Christ died for us according to the scripture. He was buried, he was raised on the third day. And if you hear his gospel and believe in it and obey it, then you are promised eternal life in a glorious eternity with him and with God. Amen. That's uh, well said, Wissam. Yes, sir. Now, we're going to close it off, but I do want to recommend this book to you, Islam in Christ's Eyes. You've just heard um, a, a, a summary. We've just scratched the surface of it. I've read this book twice. You'll want to read it once or twice. You can, where can they get this book? Uh, you can directly go to Amazon.com uh, or from uh, my ministry's website, ArabChristianMinistry.org. Okay. Find a copy. Become better equipped to love and, and preach the gospel to Muslims near and far. Mm -hmm.